Is the global food supply at risk? Hi, everyone. Welcome to this extended Real Vision Daily Briefing. In just a bit, Sean Hackett is going to give us his outlook for global agricultural commodities and how weather is likely to impact crop production. But first, my colleague Ash Bennington is here to fill us on, fill us in on a, a couple of really fascinating conversations he's been having. Hi, Ash. Hi, Maggie. It's great to be here with you. Great to see you. So we saw uh, U.S. stocks sell off for the third day in a row today. Nasdaq down. One percent. Very interesting. In congressional testimony today, Fed Chair Jay Powell um, said he expects more rate hikes and more in the inflation fight has a long way to go, kind of resetting those expectations or trying to. This struck me as very interesting in light of a deep dive conversation you had yesterday with an expert in commercial real estate. A lot of people have been asking us about that topic. Let's have a listen to a clip from that and then we'll talk on the other side. I've done these calculations. You can have a perfectly healthy Class B office building in New York City be worth $100 million in 2019. Now you let it. Ex now you let this asset experience this triple. I call it the triple headwind. The triple headwind of higher rates, uh, cash flow trouble from remote work, and uh, climate regulation. And this asset is worth $38 million. Okay, it lost 62% in value. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't think this is hypothetical. Um, this is. The revaluation of that asset, you know, this hundred million dollar plus B office building is now worth thirty eight million dollars, which means somebody needs to take a massive loss. The equity is wiped out. The debt takes a big loss. So, Ash, I, I loved that example because it was so clear about what's going on sort of underneath uh, the surface for commercial real estate. That's a big valuation reset he's talking about, especially if the Fed's not done. Yeah, absolutely. Particularly if we're in the middle of this long sort of twilight struggle against inflation as rates uh, rise. You know, uh, Stan von Nuremberg, the professor who we just spoke to uh, yesterday, is a professor of real estate at Columbia Business School. And he's something of a rising star in this space because he's been doing some of the actual underlying modeling and calculation about what's happening here. Uh, and I expect we're going to be hearing a lot more from him shortly. In fact, yesterday, uh, right before we went on the air, he said, one of my students just messaged me. Apparently, I'm quoted in the Wall Street Journal today. I think there's going to be a lot more of it. Let me break down what he said because he makes some really important points. First, he mentions uh, a Class B building as an example. That's important uh, because there seems to be this flight to quality happening right now in commercial real estate, particularly in office real estate that he's talking about. So he talks about three factors here, three structural headwinds, rising interest rates, working from home, being unmasked, obviously, and accelerated by COVID, uh, and climate regulation costs. Now, we're not talking about anything political here. Uh, I'm not uh, saying anything about the underlying nature of climate change, just that the mitigation impact, uh, the mitigation effects here that are being done are going to have costs. This makes sense. If you're uh, essentially going to have to retrofit buildings to be uh, compliant with different standards, it's going to have a cost. He talks about a 62% drawdown in valuations uh, based on cash flow. That would be simply catastrophic. Additionally, we should point out, uh, he makes this, uh, this citation about how equity holders get wiped out. This is an important point, understanding the capital structure of commercial real estate more generally. A lot of this stuff is done by debt financing. This is probably intuitive to most people. Uh, if, for example, you buy a house, you typically would go and borrow from the bank, take out a mortgage against it. Now, what's happening here, uh, you know, in commercial real estate, they talk about cap rates. That's a, a measure of the rate of return on a particular property. Uh, in its most generic form, it's a measure uh, of the cash flow against price, a little more technically net operating income against property asset valuation. What winds up happening is the equity holders get wiped out in this scenario of a 62% drawdown. These are some very, very sobering numbers. Yeah, uh, eye-opening. Professor, to put it mildly. I, I think it's fair to say, like, you did not geek out on this at all, did you, Ash? Like, I could tell that you've been, <laughs> just a little bit. But it's great because I know you've been thinking about this. We've been getting a lot of questions and having viewers ask us to do a deep dive on this. And it's fantastic. And you guys cover everything. You really set the table. And then he goes into really specific parts. Like we hear everything being tossed around, but he really breaks it down. Where are the vulnerabilities? Where does he see the risk? Some really fascinating stuff yeah. about SASB loans, I think, or SASB, the way things are structured now and the changes yeah. from before. So really, really want to encourage anybody who wants to understand about this, uh, about this topic to, to have a full listen of that. So we're, we're like rocking and rolling right now because you also <laughs> spoke to hardest working man in showbiz, spoke to Caitlin Long from Custodia yesterday. Caitlin's been at our events. Amazing. 
uh, amazing knowledge. But for for those who may be listening who aren't as familiar with her, well, just give us a little background on why we were so psyched to have her on. Yeah, so Caitlin is a very well-known person in the crypto digital asset space. As you said, uh, she's the CEO and co-founder of Custodia Bank. I call Caitlin a triple threat. She's one of the few people in the crypto space who understands all of the three major components of the space. Number one, she understands uh, the finance uh, and uh, economic models here that are used uh, to understand how this stuff works. Number two, she understands the technology. And number three, she understands the legal, regulatory, and compliance aspect of the space, which is becoming incredibly important, particularly with regulatory actions like SEC. Caitlin actually has a degree uh, in public policy and master's from Harvard and also a law degree from Harvard Law School. So she's incredibly well read in on these details on the mechanics of all, all this stuff. Function. Right. And the thing I love about having her on is that so she is sort of a, a pioneer, certainly in that space, but she's super knowledgeable about banking. I mean, she comes yeah. from from TradFi. She really understands this sector. So yeah. she's got this great sort of foot in both worlds, which is yeah. really important now. Um, we know from a macro point of view, we just talked about, we're talking about vulnerabilities. Right. We're worried about the banking system, but she's also really in the weeds on the regulatory system. And yeah. it just so happened that the both of you uh, talked about a developing story in that space, in the sort of regulatory bank supervision space that I think a lot, it's very important and a lot of people missed it over the holiday weekend. Let's have a listen to that. Well, uh, <laughs> there are a number of names uh, that of, of questionable or likely ineligibility who are incumbents. Right. So, um, you know, last year there was a big brouhaha over a trust company called Reserve Trust that uh, enlisted a former Fed governor uh, allegedly to help it get its application over the finish line, which was successful. And that that actually, you know, broke into a big story of revolving door favoritism at the Fed um, denied by the, the nominee. But it actually ended up taking down her nomination for Fed chair. This new database, in my mind, releases a whole new thread on, on that reserve trust story. I don't think reserve trust was eligible for a master account. It got one, and then the Fed ended up revoking it for eligibility reasons. But what no one knew at the time was that there were large incumbents who had the same structure with the same issues who, who had Fed master accounts all along. And that was kept very quiet. And again, it's no wonder why the Fed uh, dropped this database on a Friday afternoon before a three-day holiday weekend. So, Ash, master accounts at the Fed, no small thing. This is an important subject. It's not one that is sort of in the headlines all the time, but this is important. Yeah, it sure is. And it's coming off a data dump where the list of uh, banks that had these accounts uh, came out. The important thing here for people to understand is that this is the ability of a bank to bank directly with the Fed. It's incredibly important in the crypto space because as we've seen uh, with the spate of bank failures we had earlier this year, if you have exposure uh, to one of those banks in your crypto shop, you could potentially be in serious, serious trouble with counterparty risk. Uh, the reason this is so important to Caitlin is because getting one of these Fed master accounts would allow a shop like Custodia to bank directly with the Fed and therefore eliminate the counterparty risk. But even more generally, more broadly, and Caitlin makes this point in a very eloquent way during that conversation, it's important because it's about incumbency bias. If you're a big bank, uh, if you already have those relationships with the Fed, it's significantly easier for you to continue doing business than for new innovation to come online, which is what many of us in this space are so passionate about. Yeah, but, but I think more broadly, when there are vulnerabilities and fragility in the banking system, People don't want to be exposed to counterparty risk for for any commercial bank. And I think at some point she made uh, the observation that there's a state on there. No other states are on there. And this is just released. They were forced to disclose this. So the other state treasurers are like, hang on a second. Nobody wants to be exposed to, to commercial or counterparty risk if they don't need to be. So a little yeah. bit wonky, but it speaks to the sort of functioning of the banking system. And we all know that we have to pay uh, close attention to that. So I love I love exactly. both of these store both of these interviews because they're sort of digging in below the headlines on things that the professionals know about, but often the ordinary investors, you and I don't hear about and don't, and no one talks about it. So we're always trying to sort of push on that to make sure we keep people informed. Um, yeah. Ash, I, I understand at some point there was a, a topic that both of them are watching, which is probably something we should be watching. What was that? 
Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's, it sort of orbits the same constellation of issues that we're talking about here, uh, which is the challenge of what happens with capital flight in banks. You know, we've been talking about this on Real Vision before. In the 1980s, a very quick bank run may have taken weeks. Uh, today, it takes hours. If you are uh, a depositor in a bank and above the FDIC limit, if you hear rumors that there's the risk of insolvency, you grab your phone, you jump on it, uh, and you start moving funds to any big money center bank you possibly can. That's the risk uh, right now, which is capital flight, the risk of future insolvencies. Both Caitlin uh, and Stan raised these very core fundamental questions about the basic nature of fractional reserve banking in the United States today. Caitlin goes a little bit farther on this than Stan does, uh, but you can see if you watch both of those interviews side by side, back to back, there are both significant concerns about whether or not the regulations that we have in place and indeed the very basic business models themselves are uh, as current as they should be. And if these challenges bring risk into the system, it's a very big question and one that we explored with both Stan and Caitlin yesterday. Fantastic. Amazing stuff. Ash, thank you so much. Love it. Um, if any of you have not watched them yet, you should go and do so. They're on the platform. And if you're not already a member, scan that QR code and come join our community. We're trying to stay on top of all the stuff that you need to know. Maggie, Ash, if I could just so say much. one final thing. Yeah. This this is what Real Vision was built for. These conversations, yeah. uh, these types of topics, the kind of deep dives that we're having right now and the kind of deep dive you're about to do with Sean. Thank you so much for letting you join. Yeah, great stuff. That's it. You couldn't have said it better, Ash. Thanks so much. I know that you probably got 12 more to do now, so we're going to let you go, but thanks for being with us. All right. So as you said, we're going to switch gears and talk about another uh, issue that a lot of you have been asking us about, and that's the outlook for global crops backed by popular demand. Sean Hackett, president of Hackett Advisor. Sean, it's great to see you. Hey, Mac. It's great to be here. I know we had a great conversation last time, and a lot of what we talked about back then is actually happening. Our forecast has almost been perfectly correct up to this point as we're dealing with a major drought now in the United States. Yeah, and 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 all kinds of weather activities that that we have literally been, you know, we keep saying choking on, but it's so true. I mean, it's just been so prevalent, um, the volatility this year. Um, so I wanna sort of walk through what you're thinking about now, what we need to understand, um, because every time this has come up, we have had people say, can we get Sean back on? Can you get Sean back on so we can, we can talk about this. And of course, importantly, how it's related to some of those agricultural commodities that a lot of people have been playing or maybe looking to play. Um, just a reminder before we dive in, though, um, this is extended daily briefing. We're going to go past the half hour, but in order to stay with us for the whole conversation, you need to be a member. So same thing. Get on that QR code, get on a trial so that you can participate. Um, and we're going to take as many questions as we can. So have be ready for those. So, um, so Sean, first of all, uh, you, of course, we always turn to you. We want to understand the intersection of these changing weather patterns and the economy. I uh, want to start with just what is going on with those Canadian wildfires. We all feel a little bit of relief right now, but it's kind of been moving around the East Coast, disrupting all sorts of stuff. Is there a, is there a weather pattern that you're watching that um, that can explain why it's so bad this year? Well, <clears throat> First of all, I'd like everyone to understand the fundamental belief that we have when it comes to climate, Maggie, is that if you understand the statistics, correlations, and um, cycles of the past, you can generally have a pretty good idea of what future climate's going to look like. We talked about on Real Vision for many years now, this idea of the grand solar cycle minimum. That's a extended period of up to 30 years where the sunspots activity or the sun's activity of sunspots is at least reduced by 50%. That action tends to amplify the upper air pull fabric called the jet stream. And so instead of the zonal flow that we have been with our entire lives, we go to what's called this meridional snake-like amplified flow. And what's going on in Canada is a reflection of this extreme upper airflow pattern. And what it means is that you have you know, very, very high amplitude winds going back and forth and where the upper airflow pattern sets up the high pressure system, it's exceedingly dry, it's exceedingly hot, and it creates these extreme weather events like fires that we've seen. Like last year out west, we saw all those forest yeah. fires, and now it's up in Canada. And this is going to be a 
more consistent feature that we're going to see more and more as we go along. One of the contributing factors, Maggie. Hold on, hold on one second, Sean. Sure. As you're talking, I think Brian, I think we're looking at, I think there's a, um, it was probably last in the in the list I gave you, but there are two globes. I think this is what um, two two worlds on that graphic. I'm looking at it right now behind the scenes. If you want to, no, you had it before. Um, it's right at the beginning. Yeah, the one. Yeah, I put it last, so I reordered them, Sean. Yeah, that one. Oh, okay. We can see one screen that you guys can't see. If you're wondering, we're not magicians, but um, but that just so we can see, because I think this, I think that's the one you're talking about, right, Sean? It is correct. The, and the, I think it really il illustrates what, what you're saying. So finish your thought about why we, what this means for us. Well, normally when the sun is normal and we have normal sunspot, the left zonal flow is from west to east. It doesn't create a lot of weather volatility. Storms come in, come out. We, we, we have what we've had up until about five years ago. Then the world on the right, which is that snake-like jet stream, starts to develop as the sun goes quiet. And so where you see the upward undulation of the jet stream, mm. that's a high pressure system. That's where you get hot, dry weather. And because you have this undulation of north to south, you get extreme winds that also come from it. And so there's three things you need for, for a forest fire to really be an issue. You have to have a lot of dry weather, has to be hot, and you have to have very high winds that spread that fire like wildfire so that you start it spreads and then we obviously the smoke that came into new york city and it's been coming into the midwest becomes amplified but it's it's a it's one of the manifestations of this 30-year period of low solar activity and high amplified uh, upper airflow pattern the same thing by the way occurs in the southern hemisphere there's a jet stream down there as well it's just uh, it's just on the opposite side but it it is a dramatic change in weather volatility of an order of magnitude more than normal, and it's not going away until the sun goes back to normal. And based upon the history of this 220 year cycle of lower sunspots, we have another 30 years of this pattern to go before we can get ourselves back to normalcy. And that's the challenge for growing food. That's the challenge for how do we manage this weather volatility? Mm. Um, and how do we handle this, these rolling food shortages that have become more prevalent as we go forward? Yeah, that's 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 alarming to hear that. And and we know in the case of the wildfires, so it, it's interrupting crop, but it's also economic activity. They had flight disruptions. We had people sent home from work. I mean, it was extreme. But if you're talking about dealing with that with more frequency, we're talking all kinds of economic disruptions that we have to be aware of. Wanted to pull up another chart. I don't know if it's related to this or if it's going to speak to the potential drought conditions, but you had one on the heat content of the Greenland ocean waters. Yes. So what what so we were taught we were talking about the sun but why how what is the impact of the of the ocean water going to have on climate patterns? Sure the, the, the sun's motion and activity and the moon's motion are the gravitational forces that impact ocean currents daily and the long-term current called the thermhaline system that it's like the the gulf stream for example off the coast of of the East Coast. There's a 40 year sea surface temperature cycle. So we go through 40 years of warming and we go through 40 years of cooling and then we go through 40 years of warming. This cycle has been going on for hundreds of years based upon this activity of the sun and the moon acting on the earth's oceans. The chart shows that at the end of these cycles, at the end of these 40-year cycles, you get extreme weather volatility and extreme weather events. So for example, in the 1930s, when we had the Dust Bowl in the United States, that was the last 40-year sea surface temperature warming cycle that signified by one of the worst hot, dry weather patterns the US has experienced since that time. But notice that when we had the cooling that troughed in the late 1970s, early 1980s, we had the global cooling scare, extreme cold weather, extreme winters, short duration growing cycles. Um, once again, an amplification of weather volatility. Um, and of course, now we're nearing the peak of the 40 year sea surface temperature cycle, which means that we are now, this, this actual cycle completes around 2025, Maggie. So we're in the zone where this hot, dry, fires you know we're in this last three years where the most extreme portion of this cycle is about to be seen which makes mm. the next three years 
you know, exceptionally more volatile than normalcy before the cycle starts to turn around again. Oof. Okay. So if we so if we talk about some some impact of this, let's let's get a little bit more. We're talking broadly globally now. We're going to see all this volatility. If we look at the U.S., uh, it's been it's been a weird. I mean, for I think most people feel like that. Forest fires aside, it's been a little bit of an feels like an odd uh, weather pattern that a lot of people have been in. Um, what is the situation for the farmland? I mean, U.S. huge food producer for the world. Um, what are we looking at in terms of how the how the crop productions look in the U.S.? Remember, in the last our last conversation in February, I think it was, we talked about the Gleisberg cycle, yes, which is an 89 year cycle that typically there's a three year period where the U.S. is at high risk of a one in 50 to one in 100 year drought. 2023, 24, 25 is your three year window, like 34, 35, 36 was in the in the Dust Bowl. We discussed that you cannot have one of these if you have an El Nino. You can have it if you have a La Nina or you have a neutral condition. One of the biggest misconceptions that has occurred this year is everyone assumed because we were transitioning from La Nina to El Nino, and even though El Nino has, has technically uh, been triggered by 0.5 plus degrees C above normal in the central sea surface temperature of the Pacific, it does not mean that the atmosphere will immediately act like in El Nino. It does not work that way. So one of our big uh, forecasts was that the United States, because of the Gleisberg cycle and because of this delayed reaction to a transition from La Nina to El Nino, had the potential for an elevated risk for a high order drought. Majority of all weather men that cover this stuff for grain markets, majority of grain analysts were calling for El Nino weather, cool, wet, fantastic record yields, and they crushed the grain markets into the spring. We warned that we were expecting to see that on our last show. Um, but now the tide has turned and we have an extreme drought cycle in the central eastern grain belt. In fact, if you look at moisture precipitation from May 15th to the current, it's the so second. I think we have a chart. I'm going to just interrupt you and jump in so because your charts are so awesome. We're going to drop them in the chat, everyone, so you can really zoom in and look at them. But I think we have one talking about the U.S. is already experiencing high order drought. So if, yeah, if you it's try the, to get that up, Brian, while you talk. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's it's a different chart, but that's fine. That that. Uh, <laughs> that's Even a though we tried to put them in order, <laughs> we, he'll find it. But so so we so th 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 I think the important point here is that we were. They were expecting fantastic conditions, but that's not what has transpired. No, like I said, we have the second driest growing start to the growing season from May 15th to the present in 50 years. Only 1988 was drier up to this point. Now, I'm going to say something that's very different. Every major drought that the United States has had um, that's created a major crop problem has been hot and dry. This year has been cool and dry, meaning that we've not had a hot summer in the Midwest. We've had extreme, you know, one in 50 year low precipitation, but it's been on the cooler side. But the key to the corn crop specifically is pollination, which occurs in July. The big thing that we are focusing on is can heat come in for the corn pollination phase where the crop can really get hit hard, or are we gonna keep this cooler, drier pattern? Right now, our best guess is that we're going to not see extreme heat this current crop cycle. That we're going to, we could see some warmer temperatures. It's going to be a severe crop problem. But when you're talking about something like the Dust Bowl or 2012, the last time we had a major drought, you're talking about ye crop yields like corn down 20% below trend. In order to get that, we need heat to come in during pollination. We don't think that's going to happen. So we're thinking more along the lines of something about maybe closer to 10% below trend. By the way, it's a terrible crop. It's way below expectations. It's causing the grain markets to spike trade right now. But it's an important distinction uh, that if we miss out on the heat on this crop cycle, we're going to fall a little bit short, Maggie, mm. of that extreme Gleisberg cycle. But it, nonetheless, the moisture pattern is extraordinarily dry. And so obviously the next four weeks is critical to see how this plays out 
you know, in terms of heat and dryness, but our overall work does not see much of a change in the moisture pattern. We think this dry pattern will continue through the majority of pollination for corn. So that's interesting because I do think we, when we think drought, we always think extreme heat. But that's that's so. This is this is kind of the worst situation for for corn. I mean, what do we want to look for if we? Is there any chance at this point for it to be better than expected, or is it kind of baked in that's going to be low? It's just a matter of how much lower. Yeah, all we're trying to do now, Maggie, the, the dryness is so severe, the crop conditions are so severe that we're not we really can't rehabilitate the crop and make it a make it a good crop. The question is, is it going to be down ten percent? or is it going to be down 20%? I believe that's the range we're in now. Um, there's a couple of things we're monitoring. One is called global angular momentum. It's high level winds uh, in the stratosphere. When the atmosphere is moving faster than the earth, it's a positive global angular momentum. That tends to create a cooler temperature regime for the U.S. growing season. We have been in a positive global angular momentum through the whole month of June, hence the cooler temperature. Hmm. Typically. We need to see that go to neutral to negative in July to give us that hot signature and put the touches that we're going to move more 20% below trend. So that's one teleconnection. Right now, it does not look like that's going to move negative. It looks like it's going to stay positive, which is actually good news, meaning that's the that's not as bad as it could be if it was hot. However, the North Atlantic we just showed that chart about the sea surface temperatures is now plus one degree. C, above normal. It is tied for the record hot North Atlantic Ocean going back to 1950. That tends to push or tends to bring Texas heat northward into the mid-central eastern grain belt into the month of July. So we have these two forces battling it out. Global angular momentum, cool, this north sea surface temperature, hot boiling, trying to pr pump the heat in. And it's a question of which one you know, tends to be stronger than the other. What we're suggesting, Maggie, is that this hot North Atlantic is going to be strong enough to bring some heat in, but not strong enough to create what we call extreme heat. So I think it's going to be somewhere in between what we had in the Dust Bowl or 2012 and, and, and staying cool, which is not the best outcome, but it's a better outcome than if it was just blisteringly hot and dry. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So is this an issue for corn only, or what does it mean for the other crops in the U.S.? Oh, no, winter wheat's being harvested now, so that's kind of, but the other crop that we're talking about is spring wheat, which is grown in the northern plains and into Canada. They're actually not looking too bad. It's been a central eastern grain belt drought, which is what we forecasted with you back in February. Um, so it's really more about corn and potentially soybeans. Now, August is not as ironclad. We made this comment the last time. Um, we think the odds favor that this uh, dry pattern is going to break in the month of August. The month of August is the key month for setting soybean yields. July is the key month for setting corn yields. Once again, it does not mean we're going to have a fantastic trend line yield crop and everything is great, but it means I think relative to trend, the soybean crop will fall less below trend than the corn. We're more the mo we're most worried about the corn crop being in the biggest trouble. We think the soybean crop could be uh, unfavorable, but not as bad. We think August could be a month that we get some turn. This El Nino weather pattern oftentimes will kick in by the middle of August and just in time to save the soybean crop from the worst case scenario, that's the forecast we think is the best one to go with right now. Yeah. So walk us through the El Nino, La Nina. I think people people get confused and now we have about what it means and now we have a timing issue. Um, is it tracking the way you thought or what, what are we expecting? Because it sounds like we're going to flip at some point. All right. So, and I think you have, I think we have a chart saying La Nina to El Nino flip. Yeah, we have, we, we actually have a forecast out to 2025 of our likely scenario of what's going to happen. We are going to get a, a moderately strong El Nino uh, by the fall. In fact, our work says it's going to peak out in the fourth quarter, Maggie, but it's going to be short, quick, and out. So we're going to get this big surge, and we are technically in El Nino right now, meaning the sea surface temperatures of the Central Pacific are at point 
plus 0.65 above normal. You need to be plus 0.5 to designate El Nino sea surface temperatures in the Central Pacific. Um, so what does that mean? That means that the further we get on into the year, the more El Nino is going to take over as the dominant driver of global weather. What does that mean? It means India, it means Southeast Asia and West Africa start becoming areas of grave concern for crop production. So things like the sugar crop, which is so huge in India and Thailand, things like the rice crop, which is so huge in India and in Southeast Asia, things like the cocoa crop, where 65% of production is grown in West Africa. These are the areas that we would be focusing on new budding, developing droughts that could significantly impact production in these very important crops going forward. Whereas the U.S. is sort of a is a, is a cresting weather problem. These are an emerging weather problem. But when you when you if you look at that chart that we have that goes over the whole cycle, by the time we get to the fall of 2024, El Nino's gone. It's mm -hmm. going to be over. And we actually believe we're going to go back into a weak La Nina by late 24 into 2025. And the reason that's so very, very important is we come back to the Gleisberg cycle. The Gleisberg cycle says typically there's a three-year level of risk. Two years tend to be drought-ridden. One's worse than the other. And we think 2025, because it would be a La Nina year versus a transition year, La Ninas are typically very, very hot weather for the growing season in the U.S. So our hot, dry weather pattern that we don't quite, we're not likely to quite get this year, I think we're going to get that hot, dry pattern in 25. And that actually could be a much worse drought scenario than the one we're currently in. So this Gleisberg cycle is not over yet. This drought problem for the U.S. is not over yet. We might take a rest next year because El Nino weather will occur next year. But keep an eye on 2025. I think it's going to be Gleisberg cycle round two on the way. And we could be looking at you know a, a, another round of these kinds of issues with food shortages and, and what it means to livestock that, re that, that rely on these feed sources and such mm. forth and so on. This is part of this overall you know, weather volatility cycle that's not just happening here. I mean, Argentina had a one in 100 year drought this past growing cycle, and they had half corn crop, they had half a soybean crop. It's part of the same cycle. It's just in the Southern hemisphere. Yeah. And that's devastating when you're talking about a layer on everything else that's going on uh, in the global system, which we'll get to in a second. And I want to talk about now how that, how this impl you know, what the implication is for some of these commodities. We are at the uh, half hour, so we are going to move over to the platform. Um, if you are not a member, please join us. Jump on a trial and join us. If you're a member and you have a question, put them in the chat and we'll get to as many as we can.